evening, salam sejahtera. Mr. Adalberto Rodriguez Yarwani, Thank you, President. Ambassador Eduardo Salon. Uh, Mr. Dato Khalid Rasi, uh, our President here. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Kari uh, for this wonderful invitation. It is really an honor to be here uh, in front of such an obvious uh, audience, wrestlers from the Southeast Asia region, uh, immediate past uh, ambassador <laughs> to Kuala Lumpur, and a very good friend of Prime Minister to Dr. Mahadevi Sosofia. Uh, I'm here attending the uh, South South Cooperation Conference, the High Level Conference on Wednesday, but uh, I will have the honor of meeting the uh, Foreign Minister tomorrow morning and also uh, to have a <coughs> bilateral meeting to my delegation and the uh, uh, your delegation. Now, for some of you, uh, the name that you will uh, resonate most when you come to Malaysia was Dr. Mahade <clears throat> He was Prime Minister for 22 years until 2004, and he is Prime Minister again. Uh, I was listening to the uh, best uh, reading my CV in Spanish, uh, but I understand that he informed you that I belong to two different parties. I was in the uh, ruling party of that administration and uh, I'm now uh, a member of the ruling party of this administration. So I follow Ton Mahade uh, in that sense. We are now 10 months into the new administration, the Pakatan Harapan, or the Alliance of Hope. <coughs> we won the general election on the 9th of May last year. Uh, we probably hold the record of being the only unregistered political coalition who won an election. Uh, we tried to register ourselves as a party before the general election, but we were <coughs> not allowed to register, but we won the election. So we were not legal, but neither were we illegal. And uh, it was uh, like a second independence for some occasion. We had our first, in, uh, we had our real independence in 1957. But last year, to many of us, uh, it was like a second independence. Uh, the term that is used is New Malaysia, but that is not the term that we coined ourselves. The coalition did not use the term New Malaysia in our manifesto. In our manifesto, we simply say we want to, we want to offer ourselves as an alternative to a kleptocratic government. Uh, we run our campaign on anti-corruption and reform. But uh, during the campaign, it is the people who actually coined the term New Malaysia. And we say, okay, uh, if that is the term that people uh, would like to use, then we use it. So we now claim ourselves to be uh, the new government of uh, what is now known as New Malaysia. Somebody, and many people in fact, uh, Ask me what is then the difference between uh, the previous administration and the current administration? Because they look at the prime minister, he's the same person, but he's leading a different party, and uh, he ran the election. As I said, our campaign was on uh, anti-corruption and on the reform agenda. I know words can have different meanings, uh, and words may not reflect the best of intentions and sometimes may not reflect uh, the actual implementation. But again, 
if there are words that can be present near Malaysia, then I will say there are four words that differentiate the current administration and the last administrations. Number one is democratization. Number two will be freedom. Number three will be human rights. And number four will be all of them. I am not saying that you don't have this principles in the last administration. All I'm saying, all I'm trying to say is that we believe in furthering the cause of democratization, that winning the election is not the whole thing. Uh, we are embarking on reform, for example, in making the parliament more people-oriented or people-centered. For the first time, uh, the parliament is now having uh, more select committees including, uh, and I think this is one of the more important ones, a select committee that will look after the appointment of people in high offices, like for example, the appointment of the uh, chairman of the election commission, the appointment of the chief of police, the chief of the armed forces, uh, the chief justice, and so on and so forth. Well, we are a constitutional monarchy, the one who appoints is the king, or the Agung as we call it in the Malay language, but the king acts on the advice of the cabinet and the prime minister. And the tradition, or rather the convention, is that if there is a vacancy, the prime minister will present the name to the king, and the king will give the royal consent, and that person will become whatever position that he is to be appointed to. But even though this is still not happening, but we're hoping that uh, very soon, before the Prime Minister presents the name to the King, a select committee will vet the name. Meaning to say, it is not just one person, i.e. the Prime Minister, who has all the say in making decisions as to the appointment of senior officials in the country. For the first time, we have the opposition uh, an opposition MP to hit the Public Accounts Committee, whereas in the past for 61 years, the Public Accounts Committee was always headed by uh, a member of parliament from, from among the back benches. We are also looking at some uh, judiciary reform. Uh, coincidentally, we have announced that we will form a royal uh, commission RCI, the Royal Commission to investigate some allegation on corruption and foul play among the judiciary. Uh, we didn't plan the RCI, but uh, because someone lost a complaint and we say, okay, uh, this is probably a good time to come up with the RCI to look at the uh, judiciary. Uh, the parliament is now in session, and I think uh, this time, between now and say three weeks from now, uh, we are presenting about seven or eight uh, laws. Uh, some are to be repealed, some laws are to be amended. And these are the draconian laws or oppressive laws uh, pertaining to freedom of speech, uh, sedition, and so on and so forth. And uh, hopefully during this sitting, we will also be able to to uh, present uh, an amendment to the Constitution to bring down the uh, age of voting from 21 to 18. We are also more active in human rights, uh, the promotion of human rights. We are committed to ratify, if not all, most of the international conventions on human rights. and. Uh, on the 4th of March, we have uh, 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 registered our ratification of the Rome Statute uh, of the uh, International uh, Criminal Court. The other unique feature, or rather the corner, another new cornerstone of the new administration is that uh, we are more participatory in the way we do things. Uh, we are more friendly to civil society and the business sector. 
most of our ministries have launched or has established their consultative council which bring in experts from the civil society, from the scientific fields, from the academia and uh, even from the business uh, sectors. Now that, uh, in a nutshell, uh, I hope I have been able to impress upon you what New Malaysia is all about. Uh, for some of you who have been to Malaysia, please come again. Uh, for my uh, handsome gentleman here, you have been we have not visited Malaysia for so long, I think you should come again. And also, Ambassador, right? the last time you came was in 1999. You may not recognize uh, some places. <laughs> but please, uh, all I'm saying is uh, we are more uh, proactive when it comes to issues that were considered at one time perhaps table, perhaps uh, something that we don't discuss in public. Now, but we came into power, or rather we are here as the new administration, uh, in a world that is very challenging. On the one hand, as we celebrate democracy in Malaysia, uh, we find that uh, in some parts of the world, uh, democracy seems to be regressing. Ten years ago or twenty years ago, we were celebrating uh, new democracies, uh, starting from South Africa to Brazil to Tunisia to uh, Indonesia, just to name a few. And as we were, uh, or as we are celebrating in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, we see uh, the re-emergence of nationalism and uh, perhaps uh, ultra-nationalism uh, and uh, uh, as we celebrate uh, regionalism in ASEAN uh, in some parts of the world uh, regionalism seems to disintegrate uh, to a certain extent so th this is the challenge that new Malaysia is facing we want to celebrate democracy, we want to further the process of democratization. We need all the motivation from uh, our friends from all over the world, but we are faced with a world, well, not all parts of the world, but there are countries, and unfortunately, one or two of them are called superpowers. And they were, at one time, the, or, they, or they claim to be the promoters, the guardians, if you like, of democracy, but uh, in some places, as I said earlier, uh, democracy seems to be taking a back seat to a certain extent. But we will have to be steadfast, and we will have to continue. I don't think we know any other system better than democracy. The other challenge is, of course, uh, Malaysia, new Malaysia or old Malaysia doesn't matter, but more in the new Malaysia we want to be friendly with all states and we want to be we want to do business with all uh, states. Uh, new Malaysia, the new Malaysia administration is uh, friendly to business. I won't use the term we are pro business because that that has a different uh, connotation. But we want to be friendly with businesses and we want we want to promote uh, a fair, uh, free and fair trade. And, and we all believe in globalization, that globalization promised a lot of things to developing countries like Malaysia. But then, uh, globalization seems to submit to some of its discontent. And then you see in some places, uh, there is a uh, uh, re-emergence of protectionism. And as a palm oil exporting country, together with Indonesia, we are facing this problem, especially in Europe. So these are the challenges on one hand. But on the other hand, the center of gravity for economic growth and activities has been changing. Uh, one way to look at it is that uh, there is a shift from uh, the west to the east. There is a shift from the Atlantic region to the Pacific region. 
and in some ways uh, there seems to be a shift from the weaknesses of Europe to the promises of Asia. India and China are emerging more and more uh, into the uh, as big players or they are no longer middle powers. They are, they are China is of course one of the big powers, but India is also coming up very strongly. And in ASEAN, we are not talking about the ASEAN market. ASEAN uh, to play a role not only as exporters of raw materials, but uh, producers of uh, manufactured goods, uh, services, and so on and so forth. So, yes, uh, there are challenges, but I think uh, the new Malaysia, together with our ASEAN uh, brothers and sisters, and of course, uh, friends of the world, steadfast and we have to further the cause of democracy, uh, globalization, uh, free and free, free and uh, fair trade and so on and so forth. Now, the next question is what kind of foreign policy will the new Malaysia promote? There are two things here. Number one, the cardinal principles remain the same. Uh, ASEAN is always premium <laughs> because we are talking about our uh, nearest neighbors. Number two, we remain, as I said, we want to be friends with all countries, regardless of your ideologies and backgrounds. Number three, we remain committed to the idea of non-interference. Uh, we are a peace-loving country. Uh, we want to play the same and perhaps more important role in the uh, international organizations that we are a member of. So there will be continuity when it comes to the fundamentals. But there will be some changes when it comes to some of the way we do things, the approaches, and perhaps one or two focus. For example, within ASEAN, uh, we are promoting the idea of the not one single market. Uh, we, we, we are not going to be EU, not in the next five or ten years, but there are 600 million people in ASEAN. It's a huge uh, region. There are only 32 million in Malaysia, but there are 600 million people in Asia. So it is a huge market. And every time I talk to people from outside ASEAN, uh, my take is that people would love to trade with ASEAN, but they would prefer if you know, they don't have to go to Jakarta and, and Manila and Kuala Lumpur and Singapore, uh, you know, but they would love to go to one place and that one place represent the whole of ASEAN. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the idea is not about a single market, but having 600 people, uh, the population of ASEAN is a huge market something that we can offer better to the rest of the world. In certain areas, uh, we would like to play a more proactive role. I give an example. For some of you who are career diplomats, you will know that uh, as and when a resolution or a proposal for a new regulation is on the table, either at the UN Security Council or at the EU uh, or other international organizations, you will know that the debate or the discourse on that particular resolution or that particular regulation have or had taken place five or ten years earlier. Uh, 
uh, I think in the past we at many times we sort of become an active participant the moment the resolution is there or the moment the single text as diplomats used to you are used to this single text item that there is a single text on the table or perhaps there are three or four texts already on the table because there are different sponsors different countries sponsoring then we become active i think we don't want to wait until there, there is a text or there is a single text or there are several texts. I think we want to be part of the debate, part of the discourse from the day it started. Five years, ten years before it is brought to the table. We used to be a member of the UN Security Council. Uh, we were active when we were a member. But should we become a member again, I think we want to be more active, like for example, sponsoring more resolutions or co-sponsoring resolutions. We are now not a member of the UN Security Council, but from ASEAN, Indonesia is a member of the UN Security Council. We would like to be a good uh, brother country to Indonesia, in ASEAN uh, to work with Indonesia, for example. I, I, uh, you already know the foreign minister of Indonesia is a close friend of mine. Uh, we are on WhatsApp uh, and uh, we support each other in some of those issues that, uh, fortunately, uh, coincidentally, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia share a lot of things. We are on the same page on many issues. But even if we are not on the same page on many issues, I think there are there are ways where uh, Malaysia can have an indirect role through our colleagues, uh, either from Indonesia and from other countries. Now, the other thing is this. In the Muslim countries, in the OIC, for example, <coughs> Malaysia used to, and we will always be active, in uh, speaking for the Muslim minorities, and for the oppressed, in particular, uh, the plight of the Palestinian and the Rohingya. Yeah. Uh, and we are quite well known for being very vocal on these two issues. And we will continue to be vocal. But our belief is that these are not just the only two issues uh, for the Muslim society of the world. There are many other issues. Terrorism, uh, how about Islamophobia, for example? What do we do about it? How do we address it? How do we talk to people in Europe, in Latin America, in Africa, who are on the same page on these issues? Uh, we, want to, we want to play a role, we want to have a say, we want to connect to uh, like-minded uh, organizations, be it government or even from the civil society or from the academia. Uh, and even on issues like human rights. Uh, uh, and this is just not about the Muslim countries, but also uh, for the world at large. And when it comes to uh, playing our role on the international front, and again, I'm still uh, speaking uh, within the realm of the Muslim world, the OIC, and so on and so forth. When you talk about democracy, which country do you, do you normally look at? Most literatures, when it comes to emerging democracies, uh, people like, people like uh, Tecticon, people like uh, Esposito, uh, which would be their favorite countries? Tunisia. Because Tunisia is the only uh, successful Arab Spring country. We don't have a spring in Malaysia, but we are a Muslim democratic country. So is uh, Indonesia, for example. Uh, and there is this term called Muslim Democrats uh, among Muslim politicians in Indonesia, in Tunisia, in Pakistan, in Malaysia, and in many parts of the world. Uh, it is time to share this idea about Muslim Democrats. Uh, and. Uh, 
to 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 bridge the gap between what is understood as democracy in the West and what is understood as democracy in the East and in the Muslim world. Well, frankly speaking, there's no difference. But people tend to differentiate, and the fact that uh, there was this notion called political Islam uh, is as if. Uh, Politics in Islam is so different than politics uh, in the non-Muslim world. I think uh, Muslim Democrats uh, will not like this idea of talking about uh, political Islam. I think the discourse is over. Uh, we are talking about democracy. Then you will ask me then why do you call yourself Muslim Democrats? Well, we don't call ourselves Muslim Democrats, but literature seems to be uh, making this level. But for the time being, we are simply saying, well, Muslim Democrat is a notion that is probably more progressive than political Islam because political Islam has a lot different uh, connotations, uh, including radicalism, which is something that uh, Muslim Democrats do not want to be associated with. <laughs> and then, when it comes to other issues, I think. Uh, we want to tell the world that, yes, we are a new emerging democracy, but we are a multiracial country, we are a multi-religious country. We are democrats. We uphold the rule of law. We believe in integrity, in transparency, accountability. Uh, we, we want uh, to be part of this world that is progressing forward for the betterment of the whole of the society, the whole people. So that is what we are. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I understand that uh, we have uh, this lecture until about 7.30. Mm -hmm. All right? And uh, I will not uh, want to continue this monologue. It's going to be very... Uh, politicians, uh, you can always... Uh, be rest assured that uh, you give them the mic, they will not stop talking. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to be a good one <laughs> uh, by trying to speak less and perhaps, uh, in fact, I think it is even better if we have a two-way uh, communication. So if you allow me, uh, Mr. Yes. President and Ambassador, I will just, uh, yeah, I will just uh, invite, uh, if there are questions from the floor, I will be more than happy. Please.